4 p.m. So you're welcome to go ahead and get started, Mark. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Varian, a research archeologist here at the Crow Canyon Archeological Center. And I'm very excited about our webinar tonight, uh, which is the Utes, Colorado's Forgotten People with Ernest House Jr. Um, a few instructions before we start. Uh, you'll see your screen has that split screen and you can pull that bar over to the right to minimize the size of the talking heads uh, and maximize the size of the presentations. Uh, there'll be a live transcription on the bottom. Sometimes it's the most fun for the words that it gets wrong. Um, I would like to turn mine off and I forget how, Taylor. Can you tell me? Yeah, if you ever want to turn off your live transcription service at the bottom of the screen on that toolbar, there's going to be a stop transcription or hide subtitle, and you can click on that to remove the transcription. And where is that hide subtitle? It's going to be on the bottom toolbar where share screen, chat, Q&A, and everything else is at, uh -huh. um, though it might be hidden for you right now since you're in your screen share. Okay, thank you. Um, we will take questions at the end of the talk. The talk is going to be uh, 45 minutes, and uh, we're going to stop right at 5 o'clock tonight. Uh, but there's a Q&A button on that bar that um, Taylor just mentioned, and if you click on that, you can type your questions into there. If you're having any difficulties with this Zoom presentation, you can also catch this talk at crowcanyon.org backslash Facebook, and we're streaming live there. Uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube because we publish all of our talks on the Crow Canyon YouTube channel, uh, which is crowcanyon.org, and the transcription box is actually blocking the rest of that out for me. Um, but um, it's really great because there'll be certain things that you're going to want to go back and review, and uh, the U see, having it published on YouTube allows you to do that. Um, Crow Canyon's mission we're a beautiful uh, institution located just outside of Cortez, Colorado. This is a picture of our campus with Sleeping Ute Mountain, which is Ute Mountain Ute Nation land uh, in the background. And our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And I really encourage you to get on our website and check it out at crowcanyon.org. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges that uh, we are on Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, or Navajo, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission-related work would not be possible without the indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, we had a very generous uh, trustee on our board of trustees who made a $50,000 challenge grant so that we can continue to put on these webinars every Thursday. So for every dollar you contribute uh, in support of Discovery Archaeology webinar series, it will be matched up to $50,000. So we're extremely grateful for all of you who are tuned in and for those of you uh, who support this webinar series through a donation. Uh, we have a couple webinars coming up next. Uh, the next one is by an indigenous archaeologist, uh, Dene, member of the Dene Nation, Wade Campbell, who's getting his PhD at Harvard University. And his talk will be next Thursday, and it's titled Being Sheep Minded an ethno-archaeological study of Navajo pastoralism and its historical trajectory. Wade was raised on Black Mesa in uh, Northern Arizona and uh, is a really amazing scholar. Um, the, the following Thursday after that, August 26, will be a talk titled Preserving and Exhibiting Jewelry from Mary Coulter with Dr. Tara Travis. Um, so that will be a really exciting talk as well and we hope you can tune in. Um, COVID has hit all of the native nations hard, just like it's hit all communities hard. 
in many ways, sometimes the native nations have uh, additional challenges. And if you care to support those communities, this is a series of organizations that you can contribute to. The Pueblo Relief Fund, Hopi Relief Fund, Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. Uh, you can see those uh, links there. This is an example of where you might not have a pen handy to write these down, and you can get on the um, uh, YouTube channel tomorrow and watch this talk. This slide will come up, and you can get these connections to uh, make a contribution to these communities and their COVID relief funds. Okay, that brings us to tonight's talk. Uh, the youth, it's Colorado's forgotten people. We're so lucky to have uh, Ernest House Jr. here. Uh, there's hardly a more prestigious Coloradoan and uh, Ute, uh, Mountain Ute tribal member. He's the former di executive director for the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs, or CCIA, which he did for 12 years. Ernest, in that job as executive director, maintain the communication between the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, the Ute Mountain Ute Indian Tribe, other American Indian organizations, and state agencies and affiliated groups. In that position, Ernest worked closely with former Governor Hickenlooper, former Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn, and the CCIA members to maintain a government-to-government -government relationship between the state of Colorado and tribal governments. Ernest represented the state of Colorado and CCIA at various federal and state policy meetings and provided legislative and government related information to community stakeholders. Currently, as the senior policy director for the Keystone Policy Center, Ernest is working with various stakeholders in the areas of tribal consultation, energy, health care, education, cultural resource management, and international repatriation. Ernest previously held the position of executive director of CCIA under Governor Bill Owens and Governor Bill Ritter from 2005 to 2010. He's the 2012 American Marshall Memorial Fellow, the 2013 Denver Business Journal 40 and Under awardee, the 2015 President's Award recipient from History Colorado, and the 2018 Gates Family Foundation Public Leadership Fellow. Incredibly distinguished set of honors bestowed on him. Ernest currently serves on the Fort Lewis College Board of Trustees, the National Western Center Authority Board, the Conservation Colorado Board, and the Weenooch Development Corporation for the Ute Mountain Ute Indian Nation. He also serves as advisor to the University of Denver Native American Committee, the Denver Art Museum, Indigenous Community Advisory Council, and the University of Colorado Center of the American West. Ernest is an enrolled member of the Ute Mountain Ute Indian Tribe in Toyot, Colorado. He holds a rich, a rich tradition in his position as son of the late Ernest House Sr., a longtime tribal leader for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, and he's the great grandson of Chief, Chief Jack House, the last hereditary chief of the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. Ernest, it is such an honor to have you here tonight and we're all really looking forward to your talk. I'm gonna stop my video um, and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. All right, well, Mark, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, and uh, thanks to Taylor, first and foremost, thanks to Crow Canyon. Thanks to Becky Hammond and the team there who've done an amazing job just really trying to educate uh, the general public around not just ancestral Pueblo people, but all the different tribes uh, who always and continue to call Colorado home. So Mike uh, Deguven, thank you very much for that, for that opportunity. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here uh, with you all so that uh, we can go ahead and jump right into this. Um, I first started this series, um, a couple of these presentations uh, a while back. <clears throat> I talked about the Utes, Colorado's Forgotten People, but what I've added this evening is searching for truth and reconciliation because I think it marks the time that we're in. Um, 
it marks the time that we're in both in Colorado, what we've seen, what I've seen in the last 15, in the last 20 years. Uh, I'll give you some examples of how not only Ute history, but how we're, we've been trying to raise the awareness of Ute issues and, and how we've been able to establish that government to government relationship. And then how do we transition into other areas of interest? Um, I'll be giving some examples and, and don't have the, the, the answers to a lot of these questions that, that you're probably seeing throughout the country uh, in, from our brothers and sisters up in First Nations up in Canada around boarding schools, uh, around place names. Um, I, I get asked that every week around, you know, how, why is it important to, to change a name? Why is it important to establish partnerships with tribes and, and what are land acknowledgements and how do you do that type of conversation? So I think right now, especially after uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the, the awareness around indigenous issues coming to light more so, it, it's been really interesting. And so that's why I put searching for truth and reconciliation because that's really, I think, under the umbrella. I don't throw reconciliation out there um, lightly. I know that there's a long history, especially here in Colorado, last 150 years, that we have some very dark chapters, but I truly believe, and, and I've written about this in different op-eds, that um, I'm one that's coming at this from partnership. I, I, I believe in the education and the acknowledgement with tribes and moving with tribes and supporting uh, that voice so that we can move together uh, in, in a good way and, and for a betterment for our people and for the next generation. So that's why I've titled it like this. So we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and, and move to the next one. I always start out with recognizing kind of what Mark had mentioned at the very end, two instrumental uh, individuals in my life. Um, first, Chief Jack House, who was the last tributary chief of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, who a lot of you uh, Ute Mountain tribal members are, are related to. And I think who, who passed away in 1971 and didn't get a chance to ever meet him. But it's been interesting as I've had this career and when I was working with my father really closely, hearing how my father would also follow him to Washington DC, be an interpreter for him, you know, when he was fighting for Ute water rights. And then finally, when the settlement came and created McPhee Reservoir uh, there in 1987, you know, there's a lot of things that were passed down from his knowledge to my father and then from my father to me. And, and I often think so much about what I would give. And maybe you all think about the same thing with, with your relatives that have passed or your ancestors. Man, what we wouldn't give for that opportunity just to sit across and have coffee with these people and go, wow, look, look where we are today. Look, look, look at the struggles. Look how far we've come, but yet look how much so far we have yet to go. Um, and then the person on the right is, is my father, Ernest House Sr. Um, the, the late Ernest House Sr. passed away 10 years now. I can't believe it's been 10 years, but he was so instrumental in, in the history and everything that, that he's passed on to me and, and also giving me this opportunity around emphasizing the importance of bridge building. Um, and so that's, that's where it comes from. And that's my recognition that I want to make sure that I, that I give. So who are the youths? Well, um, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a very uh, 30,000 foot um, overview of the tribes. I mean, you can get further into there's some great publications and books out there that do a deeper dive and I encourage you to look at those and you can go to U Indian Museum. It's always a great resource. Um, but we usually start out with, let's say, seven bands. Uh, there was more than that, but we usually start out with seven. And these are the names. And if you're in Colorado or around Colorado, maybe you've seen these names of uh, national forests, rivers, um, counties, um, you know, things like that around the state of Colorado. But these seven bands consolidated to make up three tribes. I think that's one something that a lot of non-Native community members don't realize is we had such a large population of Native Americans here in what we call the United States and that were made up of several bands or clans uh, that eventually consolidated, especially around the, the government process in the 1800s, around the Indian Wars so that they were, you know, starting to corral and, and put Native Americans onto reservations. But these seven bands would have been around the state. I'm gonna show you these locations they would have been to. But when they consolidated to make up our three tribes today, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in Toyot, Colorado, which I'm a member of is the Wimanuch Band. The Southern Ute Indian Tribe, our sister tribe just outside of Durango in Ignacio, Colorado, or the Moach and the Capote Tribe. And then the Northern Ute Indian Tribe, our brothers and sisters and relatives to the north are in Fort Duchesne, Utah. 
and they make up the remaining four bands. And also forcibly removed from the state of Colorado, I might add, and I'll circle back to that here in just a little bit. So where are we in, in the state of Colorado? Here's a map of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and here really just the West. And um, the green dotted line is a line that shows the, the, the vast territory that the Utes would have traveled for game. We're nomadic people. We, we, that's why a lot of times people would call us the, the people of, of, of the Shining Mountains. We were always following game. Uh, always moving through the Rocky Mountains. And so these are why the red dotted line signifies where we would have really stayed and honed in on where these bands would have stayed in on. But we went out to the plains of Colorado, uh, but the mountains were really our home. And if <clears throat> you'd ask the archeologists today in Colorado, they'll tell you that Utes, uh, what we call Utes are, have been in Colorado for the last 10 to 12,000 years. If you ask us, we say that we've, we've always been here since time immemorial, just like if you ask a lot of indigenous communities, we, we're born from these mountains, we're born from these valleys and these riverbeds. Our language and our songs are still in them. And so we, that's why we get really excited when we get an opportunity to go back to the Gunnison Valley, the Yampa Valley, uh, the Vail Valley, the Estes Park, Garden of the Gods, because these places were so important to, um, to, to our culture, to our survival. So here would have been the bands that would have most likely been in that area. Now, again, we'd move with the climate, we'd move with the seasons, uh, and then we would go back to there. So, so still hunting blind standing in Rocky Mountain National Park. The last bear dance ceremony was held in Garden of the Gods outside of Colorado Springs in the early 1900s. And so we were removed out of that location as well. And so you'd see that we were always moving around, but Predominantly, this is the area that these bands would have, um, would have maintained. So here's the state of Colorado uh, as we see it. The green, dotted, the green dots just signify locations that you may, may know if you're in Colorado or from Colorado. Um, I usually say that this would have been the first reservation or the first territory, Ute territory, uh, the whole state. We didn't have any boundaries, um, able to come and go as, as we'd like. Then there was the first, first Ute reservation established in 1868, which ha was headquartered out of Meeker, Colorado. And we're gonna circle back to Nathan Meeker uh, here in a little bit. Um, and then once that was developed, <clears throat> then you started seeing the, the changes to treaties. By 1874, following the Bruno session, uh, it would look like this. And if you're wondering at that big chunk in the southwestern part of the state and wondering why, well, if you've ever been to the San Juans, you know there's over 400 miles of tunnels uh, due to mining and due to mining expansion and really westward expansion. Now you still start to see uh, westward expansion and Homestead Act and all these policies that were starting to be pushing uh, of that western portion. So you start to see the, the dwindling of the, the reservation lines. Now, this is just the example of Ute Mountain. Other tribes, um, Fort Laramie Treaty, Fort Wise, other tribes on the Eastern Plains, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, Shoshone, other tribes were doing, involved in other treaties. Um, this is just giving you the, the Ute example here. And then by the 1880s, this is what it was reduced to. It was called the Ute Strip. And was following the Meeker Massacre and Battle at Mill Creek. Um, the Meeker, incident is what a lot of youths refer to it as. Rocky Mountain uh, PBS did a great um, video on this uh, called the, the Original Coloradans, which is about the youths that you can look up and, and you can watch. And it talks a little bit why it gives actually some great um, perspectives and interviews of youth elders talking about why youths call this the youth incident instead of, or the Meeker, the Meeker incident instead of Meeker massacre. When I think of a massacre, I'm thinking of Sand Creek and you know what happened on the Eastern Plains. And um, this, how unfortunate this is to see from the whole state down. And one thing that I remember an elder at Southern U, um, Alden Naranjo, um, say who, who the late Alden Naranjo had the honor of working with him. And it's in the exhibit at History Colorado that the Utes lost Colorado in 40 years. Now, if you think about that, We've been here on a timeline uh, that let's say archeologists, anthropologists would say for the last 10 to 12,000 years. And 
Yet from the early 1800s and the 1860s by the 1880s, um, it was gone. We lost what we knew. We lost what the survival, the, the hunting blinds in, in what we now call Rocky Mountain National Park, the ceremonies that were done in beautiful areas like Garden of the Gods, the valleys, the communities that, that we established in a lot of these places. Now they're, you know, they're highways. The Ute trail systems are now, thank, thankfully, you know, CDOT has, you know, went over those with roads that Highway 285, Highway 160 that I travel and I use all the time and other people do as well. But this was, when I look at this map and this time frame, man, in, in 40 years, that's what that change brought. And here's today, the Ute Mountain Reservation is the outline in blue. We're 600,000 acres in three states. Um, the little portion that goes into Southeastern Utah uh, is also a small community called White Mesa. Um, and then we also expanded in Northern New Mexico. The Southern Indian tribe is in the red. It's a checkerboard reservation solely within the state. And I have a little bit more demographics here where I talk about, you know, Ute Mountain, again, a little over 2000 enrolled members. So we're small tribes. Um, we, like I said, 600,000 acres, we're a communal land owned reservation. So if you know anything about land, we won't get too specific in it. There's really three types and throughout the United States, it's, it's no reservation, which are tribes on the Eastern Plains and the West Coast, a lot of times on the East Coast because they were first in contact. And so a lot of that land was depleted a long time ago. Um, and then there you have a checkerboard reservation, um, you have fee land, and then you have communal land. Communal land at Ute Mountain, we have about over 90% is held in trust, which we're fortunate to have. It's what a lot of tribes are fighting for to turn their fee or transition their fee land into trust land. But in order to get their fee land, they have to go back and actually purchase land from willing land sellers to bring that land back into um, the, the uh, original plot that they had had before it was sold. Um, and so Ute Mountain has a communal land owned reservation. We have a seven member governing council, a chairman or chairperson, council members. Um, every year is an election year. Our chairperson serves three year terms, our council serves two year terms, uh, and they're revolving. So this year coming up this fall, Ute Mountain has two positions up, two council positions up for election. And so they'll be going into, into that process. Um, this last bullet point has been one that has definitely been, if you followed Native American history, even contemporary issues, burning issues, this is one that has been front and center and it's, um, requ it's blood requirement. Who gets, to who gets to say who is Native American and who's not? You have a federal government standard, which is a quarter to full. You have a tribal standard of being enrolled in that specific tribe, which is, uh, for my tribe, is half blood to full blood, which is one of the highest in the country. Um, there's 574 federally recognized tribes. Ram Dolan is just showing you two examples of two tribes right now. And so that's been very controversial, primarily because if you look, if I bring you back to the little over 2,000 enrolled members, and we have a, a growing population and a growing population that, that's also living off the reservation. And if you start growing your family, how can you bring that in? Um, I, I've talked about this in other, in other series as well. I won't spend too much time on it, but I, I speak from this, me personally, because I'm, I'm half, I'm half you. Um, and I'm also half Hispanic and I, it wasn't an issue that I thought about until I grew up and I got older. And then I met my, my now wife, who's not Native American, not a member of the tribe. And I remember we had to sit down and go, you know, I wonder how is this going to impact our family? And now I have um, great kids and, and a daughter uh, who is not a member and now old enough to start putting the pieces together around, well, wait a minute, why am, why am I not? Am, am I Native? And Spending a lot of time in the Denver metro area with my previous position, I met a lot of native youth who grew up in the urban area. And if you haven't read the book, There There by Tommy Orange, I really encourage you to do that. It's, it's won numerous awards, but it talks about the perspective of the urban American Indian experience. Those American Indian populations, which are the largest in Colorado, I'll show you that the largest of our population is in the Denver metro area. It's not in Southwestern Colorado, it's not in Southern Colorado, not Northern Colorado, it's in the Denver metro area, which is seven county district. And it represents 200 different tribes or tribal members that live in that seven uh, county district area. Um, and this has been an ongoing issue. This will continue to be 
Some tribes have changed it and they have the opportunity to change it, um, but it's up to them to do it. And so we'll move on to the Southern Indian tribe, same type of demographics. I'll show you a little bit less population, 1,400 members, 300,000 acres. Again, checkerboard reservation, half trust, half fee. Seven member governing council, same type of election structure. But look, they're down to a quarter full blood membership requirement. And the Northern youths are also different as well. So this is an ongoing conversation that I think we'll just continue to have. I think because I was here in Crow Canyon and doing this presentation for Crow Canyon, and I appreciate everything that they do, I wanted to uh, bring up the, our work with Native American Protection and Creatures, NAGPRA, which <clears throat> I use as an example of why I think one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, but one of the primary reasons why the U tribes in Colorado have one of the strongest relationships with the state than any other tribe in any other state. And I put that out there and I'm not saying that just because I'm a, bi I'm a bit biased and working in Colorado, being Colorado resident, being a member of the Ute Mountain Tribe. But it's because of these policies that you see here. We created this nation's first ever state burial protocol in 2007 that took us three years to meet with tribes that once called Colorado home that no longer that were forcibly removed over the last 150 years by treaty, by gunpoint, um, you know, what, what have you, that that's what happened in those, in those situations. Um, then we moved from that to develop a memorandum of understanding with tribal, federal, and state partners regarding the reburial of Native American human remains and funerary objects in 2013, and then moved to offer training for other states and tribes. I remember when we very first got this done, going to the National NAGPRA Review Committee um, going back a few different times, trying to get its final approval, but then taking the trainings to places like Colorado Sheriff's Association, Colorado Coroner's Association, believe it or not, in Colorado, and I think it's probably just because it's an, it's an older law, hasn't been updated, you don't have to have a medical background to be a coroner, because a lot of times in rural Colorado, you know, the sheriff might have been the coroner, or the judge might have been the sheriff and the coroner, but now when you have archaeologists permitted archaeologists go out to research and go out to investigate these, these um, uh, unidentified, culturally unidentified Native American burial sites, which Colorado receives 15, 12 to 15 on average every year, um, you want to ensure that, that those folks out there are educated about it. And so by bringing that education to corners, to first responders is helpful uh, for a lot of those different reasons. So I'm going to keep going here. Um, Taylor, am I, are you hearing me okay? Mark, am I, are we good? Every once in a while, a couple of words cuts out and I notice it's upon movement, um, but most of the time you're coming in clear. Okay. I'll try to bring this closer to my, my mouth. Maybe that, maybe that will help a little bit. So now you're sounding a bit farther away. Okay. <laughs> maybe I'll try to go back to where I was a little right? bit. Right? Yeah, right there sounds perfect. All right, I won't move, I promise, I'll, I'll try not to. So here is a list of, when I talk about that 2007 protocol, um, and it took us three years to meet with all these tribes and they come up with an agreement. Colorado is the first state to come up with an agreement with tribes that were no longer resided or had lands in the state of Colorado. This is the list I'm talking about. This is a list of those 48 tribes. Now, 46 of these, I'll remind you, have been removed by treaty um, or by gunpoint, like in the, in the, in the situation of, of the, the Northern Utes, the Ute Indian tribe in, in Utah. Well, you'll see a lot of Pueblos, 19 Pueblos who are in New Mexico, the Salada del Sur Pueblos in Texas. A lot of these tribes are uh, tribes we met with in Oklahoma, in the Dakotas, um, and, and the list goes on and on. So that's the list. And, and often you might hear people in Colorado and state leaders reference historical tribes of Colorado, this is the list that they're talking about. So if the state legislature passes bills like this last year that offers Native American enrolled students of these tribes receive, will receive in-state tuition if they go to any in-state higher education institution um, and they're members of these tribes, they'll, they'll be able to pay an in-state tuition instead of an out-of-state tuition. That's a piece of legislation that's been proposed for many years and it was great to see the, the legislators finally get that done this year. So moving on, I wanted to talk about some projects that why it's so important on this truth and reconciliation. Now, I mentioned that there's 574 federally recognized tribes throughout the United States. And 
a few years ago, I did a little bit of research around how many of those tribes had actually have been able to solidify their water rights settlements. And it was still a very low number. I think it was less than 50 at the time. The Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and Southern Ute Tribe are two of those tribes that have solidified their water rights settlements, which is huge. Especially if you're in Colorado, if you're on the Western Slope, if you're in Southwestern Colorado, you know the drought that we have right now that's going to deplete McPhee Reservoir, which was developed in huge part because of the Ute Water Rights Settlement Act, something that my father fought for for a long time, my great grandfather and other tribal leaders, not just my family, but so many other tribal leaders fought for. Um, this is a picture of Lake Night Horse, <clears throat> which is the newest um, recreational body of water in Colorado. Um, and this was before it opened up to the public. Um, we were on this dam, we were getting a tour by the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, I remember being a part of the survey crew or at least touring the survey crew on the bottom before the water was even put in here. Um, and now I was just there a couple of weeks ago looking at, an, at a perch overlook. And if you ever go, there's a Ute uh, garden there that talks a little bit about the Ute history of it, which I encourage you to go check out. Um, a beautiful reservoir. Um, and you can see that there's all, all these things that happen because of it. Obviously, Anima Plata Water Project was very controversial in its time. What's so interesting now, especially as we debate water policy in the West, water policy in Colorado, is that it's so important to have the tribes at the table. Tribes need a seat at the table because they hadn't had one for so long. And especially the second point, the recreational plan or water delivery system for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. The Ute Mountain Ute Tribe is supposed to receive 25% of this water. Southern Ute is supposed to receive 25%. Navajo Nation is supposed to be 15% and the rest to the city of Durango, farmers, ranchers and the state of Colorado. <clears throat> I bring that up because in the deliberation and back and forth with Congress when they were trying to pass Anima Plata. The, watery delivery, the water delivery system for Ute Mountain was removed because of the price tag. And at a negotiation, the tribe removed it. And so now when our farm and ranch enterprise, which is one of our several enterprises that we have at the Ute Mountain tribe, one of the first established at the tribe, it's a 7,000 acre irrigated farm system. And we're out of water, along with the farmers and ranchers in Southwestern Colorado because of the drought and the climate change that has impacted McPhee Reservoir and the water systems and the tributaries down to Dolores River. Um, we can't access this. We have water sitting there and we can't access that. Um, should some be let out? Can we can we let it out into the, into the Animus and have it enter into the San Juan and have it come back up into Colorado where it barely comes through the tip of the Ute Mountain or the very bottom part of the reservation? Could we pull that out then? Who knows? These are conversations that tribal leaders are having right now. But it's not just this water, it's the Colorado River, it's the upper basin, it's the lower basin, it's the 10 tribes, not just Ute Mountain, but other tribes that are so dependent on this. And when, every, when people now have, have kind of heard the tagline, water is life, if it wasn't from you know, pipeline protests or, or around the importance of water and the need for that to indigenous communities, we're also looking at what is impacting our Southwestern community. And I always think about ALP would not have happened. I don't think Dolores Water Project would, have, would not have happened if we wouldn't have seen partnership and collaboration like we did when historically hadn't been there. And I think that that's what's going to need to happen, um, trying to figure out a, a, a way and a path forward. Another example of why we have this great working relationship um, with the state and the tribes is that Colorado has the only example of a off-reservation hunting right between a state and a tribe. And this is based off the Bruno Hunting Agreement. This Bruno Hunting Agreement was in, signed in 1874. It's older than the state of Colorado. And we updated that agreement in 2008 and 2013. If you're ever wondering, what it looks like to update a treaty from the 1870s. That's how many copies that you need uh, on that desk in front of that's uh, then Governor Hickenlooper, former Chairman Gary Hayes of Ute Mountain, and then um, uh, former Head Department of Natural Resources there on the right. And um, 
this was landmark. And I think you see examples where um, the other tribes, specifically in Wyoming, where you have uh, Wyoming B. Martinez, that are also challenging these same type of conversations. In Colorado, we've, been, we've made a process work and we've actually shared that with other states as well. Um, I'm just doing a quick time check because I want to make sure we get uh, to any questions. Here's a, uh, a economic impact report that was done by the state, first time ever, showing that businesses that were owned by American Indians, how much they were actually contributing to the state economy. So Colorado's population today is about 2% of the state's population identifies as American Indian. Now, if we dissect that a little bit more, um, which is very similar to nationally, nationally 2% of the US population identifies as American Indian. But in Colorado, that 2% um, is about 60,000, uh, let's say, but that number 60,000 is that 2%. Of that 60,000, over 40,000 live in the Denver metro area. Um, which is why I say that there's a lot of growing population, growing American Indian population moving to urban areas, not just Denver, Salt Lake, Phoenix, um, Albuquerque, you know, and, and you'll see that across the board, but they're moving there for jobs, they're moving there for housing, they're moving there to go to school. And so this is why we want to do an economic impact report. And it showed that even though the 2% of the population in Colorado who identifies as American Indian, which is very small and not all of them are, are business owners, contribute $1.2 billion back to the coffers of the state. That's important for our state leadership to know, that's important for our local government officials to know, especially if you're in Southwestern Colorado, economic tourism is a big driver. Mesa Verde National Park, Tribal, Ute Mountain Tribal Park, where I used to be a tribal park tour guide. You know, all these things, Crow Canyon. I mean, so many great opportunities and resources to learn about. Um, that's why that was there. Then we moved over to state tribal consultation you're gonna hear more about these if you have not. Under the Obama administration, um, the state tribal consultation policy was shared across different federal agencies. Um, it's come back uh, as a big emphasis under Secretary Holland, Department of Interior. Um, we actually implemented this, we weren't the first state, many other, other states were doing it as well, but it was seen as a best practice. And it was like, of course, why wouldn't we have state agencies partner with tribal agencies to talk about human services, to talk about Indian Child Welfare Act, to travel to talk about foster care issues um, with Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, um, to talk about um, enrolling more Native Americans in healthcare, if it's Connect for Health Colorado, if it's on top of Indian Health Service. Um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment clearly runs a lot of studies around showing that Native Americans continue to have um, high um, health disparities uh, all that's important and they should be having consultation, annual consultations with the tribal agencies as well um, to move the needle. We're not going to move the needle around healthcare. We're not going to move the needle around education unless we actually sit down around the table and, and spend time to talk about it. I did throw this example in here because I think it was, it was one that I was honored to be a part of. Um, it was one that was heavily involved in with then governor. Um, and if you know anything about, if you don't know anything about the Sand Creek Massacre, I encourage you to Google it, research it. Um, if you have the opportunity to go actually go visit the site in Eads, Colorado, I encourage you to do so. Um, it's a National Park, National Park Historic Site. Um, and this was the day where the governor, then Governor Hickenlooper had apologized for the state's role in the Sand Creek Massacre. And I, work with Boulder, uh, city of Boulder around Sand Creek Massacre. I still talk with a lot of these Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. I serve on the advisory board for the Sand Creek Massacre Foundation to bring awareness to this. You know, ever since I started at the state in the early 2000s, I remember providing a proclamation on behalf of the state to the runners once a year, these youth um, tribal runners from Cheyenne and Arapaho will meet and do ceremony at the national park site in Eads. And if you don't know, Eads is about three, uh, three and a half hours uh, from Denver in Southeast Colorado. And these tribal youth runners, they will run day and night. They start there at the site and they run all the way to the state capitol. They run to the west steps of the capitol as a reminder in honor and remembrance of their ancestors who were brutally massacred and mutilated. And at that time, I remember giving proclamations to 
there would some days it would be raining, some days it would be snowing. This was always uh, in November, always during kind of the Thanksgiving break where folks were downtown Denver streets where nobody was around and, and seeing it over the years, the crowds getting bigger and bigger and the awareness getting greater and greater. It's, it's, it was just so good to see because it was this, it's a history that needed to be told. It's, it was a dark chapter clearly in Colorado's history, but it's something that people just did not, were not aware of. We then moved to American Indian mascots. I don't know if you saw legislation this year that finally passed that banning American Indian mascots in K through 12. Um, so that was something that was finally done. So today's government to government relationship looks like the governor having annual meetings with the tribal leadership. Um, I forgot to put one here of, of Governor Polis because that's happened. He's met with tribal leaders uh, as well, especially coming out of COVID, the state of Colorado. I think this administration has had so much support, more so than I've seen around uh, focusing on broadband support, focusing on education initiatives, you name it, trying to reach out and ensure that tribal communities are, are getting attention to, the, to issues as well. I said I'd circle back to the Battle of Milk Creek, which is September 29th, 1879. Nathan Meeker and a good friend of mine who unfortunately passed, um, who wrote The Utes Must Go, Peter Decker. Um, this last year he passed away. Um, if you haven't read that publication, I encourage you to go. It's, again, it's The Ute Must, Utes Must Go by Peter Decker. And um, P Peter did a great research in not only in his book, but about Nathan Meeker. And this was Nathan, what was one of the publications that Nathan Meeker was was set out to do. And, and if you don't know the history of Nathan and the start of uh, Colorado, you know, with, with uh, Horace Greeley and others that were moving out and establishing these communities, I encourage you to do that. But this is what was he was saying about youths and, and Native people at the time. If you're ever up in Meeker, Colorado, and you're heading to Craig, um, there is a, a path that you can take that's off the main highway. It's on a dirt road, it takes you to this valley and it opens up and it's a beautiful valley. And right in the middle of the valley, you'll see this marker. And this marker, you'll see two of them. One of them is uh, for the US Calvary soldiers who lost their life, which I think might've been around uh, under 15, 13, 14. And then there's this marker put up by the Ute Indian tribe, the Northern Utes as we refer to, of the tribal members of, of, the, uh, of the Utes who lost their life. And this was where the Battle of Milk Creek, which was the aftermath of what happened, the, the, what they call the Meeker massacre, the Meeker incident. But I asked this little girl because at the time there was a ceremony there, they were celebrating some anniversary. And this little girl in her jingle dress was there and she's a, she herself was, was a member of the Northern Ute tribe. And I had asked her if I could take her picture, of course her, her parents. And this picture to me, shows that why we're, how we're still here, how as a resilient people, we're still here. That there is policies clearly over the last 150 years who have been established to eradicate my people. But even with these publications that, that were out there, even when history is supposed to be written by the victors, she still stands here. And I think that's such a, a strong testament to how resilient our people are, uh, not just for the last thousands of years, but moving into the future. I think that gives way to other indigenous events, indigenous people's day events that you may see in your community. Uh, Chapita Rising was one that I went to. This is a picture of that where they renamed a 13er outside the, the town of Salida, Colorado after Chapita, uh, Chief Bure's wife. You know, communities are getting very, um, they're getting very creative. And in doing so, they're inviting tribal indigenous communities back. They invited be a part of the celebration. And that's been great to see across Colorado. I talked about the name change proposals, land acknowledgements, agreements. You know, this is a picture on the left of the Gore Mountain Range, uh, which spreads from Frisco, Colorado to Kremling. Uh, it was named after uh, Lord Gore. Uh, you can look that information up, but that process and that community is still going. Uh, the conversation, and I've done talks about proposals of, of um, Evans, uh, Mount Evans. Um, and obviously with the connection with Sand Creek and those tribes, 
are a part of that conversation. Moving on to something that Mark talked about, and then I'm gonna to come to a, a close here. Is, um, something obviously with our NAGPRA experience in Colorado, seeing the partnership that we were able to establish, we ended up taking that conversation across seas over to Europe, and particularly with countries within the European Union, because it's been so hard and so complex to get to understand NAGPRA, to build on, uh, to have all those conversations going on that we thought, what if we could part build partnerships with museums in Europe? What is even over there? I mean, probably everything's in the British Museum, right? And I've never been there, and I don't know how many of my tribal elders have. So what if we were able to establish this working relationship? So at the time, we established this website, Restoring Ancestral Connections, which is now being run by the American Indian um, uh, Association um, out in D.C. And they're because they're taking on a huge initiative on international repatriations where these collections that in these museums in other countries around the world but in this example in europe um, would want to partner with the tribe and just to let you know these are just some examples of some of the museums that were partnered in and had partnered in the process who are interested in talking about this and building that relationship and if you haven't followed i mean just just the at Mesa Verde alone that was announced under the Trump administration where the president of Finland returned several hundred, if not thousands of artifacts back to the Mesa Verde region that had been removed in the late 1800s, right before the park was established in 1908, which was the same year that the Antiquities Act was passed because of Gustav Northern Schultz, you know, this, this um, very intro, uh, scientists that came and started doing um, research in that new called newly placed called Mesa Verde National Park. I encourage you to go check that out. It's been a fascinating, fascinating process kind of seeing that how that's out. I end with this picture as I end with a lot of these pictures of this presentation. Um, this is a black and white photograph that was taken in Mancus Canyon, which is I've often thought the heart of the U reservation that we have today. A lot of people look at Toyok as our community. This is where the Utes were sent pretty much to, to die. Um, when we consolidated and we had the Ute Strip, remember we lost Colorado in 40 years and we were on this Ute Strip. This is where our tribal members, our families were sent. And this picture was taken, it would have been in the late 40s. Um, you'll see a, a dog, kind of a husky there on the left and um, you woman on the left standing, there's looks like a girl and a little boy. And then on the right side, you might be able to make out a, a tall lady. Uh, she has a trench coat. She was sent from the government. She was sent to provide rations to the Ute families that lived there. She would provide sugar, flour, and red paint. And people would be like, why red paint? Red paint was meant for the youths to mark their livestock with. Instead of branding, they'd mark their livestock. Well, a lot of the youth families, including this one, didn't have livestock and couldn't afford the livestock in that time frame. So they would start painting on the walls behind them. And so that's how you see the images behind the picture on the wall on that sandstone rock. And if you have a chance to go to the Ute Mountain Tribal Park, and I encourage you to look that up, it'll talk about, and you'll actually stop at this exact site this site is called Chief Jack House Hogan site. This is where my great grandfather had his Hogan. That's where he lived um, a lot of his early life. The picture, actually one of the pictures up on those wall on the left side of the wall is him riding a horse. Um, but the other interesting thing about this picture is right behind the little boy, there's a little tiny head if you can make it, make it out between the girl who's kneeling and the little boy Right behind is somebody who's kind of scared, looks like he's hiding. That's my father. That's the late Ernest House Sr. This is where he was born. This is where he lived until he was removed and forced to go to a boarding school in Ignacio, Colorado. Um, that's a whole nother chapter. That's a whole nother chapter that we're just now getting into, that we're just now scratching the surface. And all of this is so important. All of this is so important to our state's history our national history and our shared history, because it is a shared history. I'm not blaming anybody for any of this, but
but I want you to be aware of it and I want to acknowledge it because so much of our generation, so much of our sustainability comes from this history. And so that's why I think it's so important. This is me at that exact site um, showing that same picture. Like I said, I was a tribal park tour guide in, in the 90s and I still get the opportunity to go down there every now and then and take some groups. It's an important connection. It's an important connection to take my family, my own kids. It's something that I think is so important to share that and move that conversation forward. That's it, folks. Thank you so much for your time. I think I might have gone a little bit over. I think we have about 10 minutes for any, any questions that you may have. And there's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much, Ernest. Um, we're so honored to have you as a speaker and uh, really want to thank you for all the work you're doing. Uh, for all of us here in Colorado, in the United States and beyond. Uh, your work is really remarkable. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have some questions. So let me, I'm just going to start with the first one that came in. And this person said, I've always been unclear to what extent people on the Ute Mountain Ute lands are included in the demographics for Montezuma County, which is the county that we live in here in Southwest Colorado. For example, when, we, when reports are out there of voting results, vaccination percentages, average income, uh, are Utes included in the rest of the county statistics? It's a great question. Um, I'm not sure to the extent that they are included, but I will tell you that there's there's has been some some issues around how data is collected, how it's used. Uh, I will tell you that over 90% of uh, members on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation meet or exceed federal poverty guidelines. Um, is that information captured correctly or adequately in countywide data sets? I I'm not sure. Uh, I will also say that there's more surveys being done by Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, most importantly, they do a, a, a survey around teens and, and high schoolers around the state. Uh, two years ago, they came out with a health disparities report for young, uh, young people and American Indians led across the board in those. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure what, if, if those are reflected in Montezuma County, um, but I think it's important that they should be. And I think it's important that the, the relationship between the county and the tribe, you know, I've often said, what's good for the tribe is good for the county. What's good for the county is good for the tribe. I mean, you have these two communities that have had to be, had to work together and move together and move forward. And the only way to do that successfully is to do that together. And, and I think there's a lot to share there. Thank you. Um, also the um, compliments for your talk are <laughs> coming in uh, on the chat line. So you might wanna look at that before you oh, leave. Thank people you. really enjoyed the talk. Um, that's a, another question that I have is, what are your current top three priorities for the work that you're doing? Um, that's a great question. Um, right now, uh, one, of my, one of my projects is working with the city of Boulder on establishing a tribal consultation with 14 tribes. They've created a, there's, there, there's only two communities I know, a local government that have agreements with tribes. Um, one's Colorado Springs and one is, um, one is the city of Boulder. And those are, those are agreements across a variety of areas, but I think a lot of, especially the growth and the population on the front range of Colorado, um, there's a lot of concern around not just the growth of that, but some of these locations that have always been sacred to indigenous communities are being, are being encroached upon with, with housing and, and trail systems. And as counties are building land plans, management plans, that's, what, that's one of the concerns. So I'm working with the city of Boulder on that. Right now, um, they've also renamed one of their parks. They're bringing more awareness around indigenous um, relationship. The second project is one I'm with, I'm on right now as we speak. I'm in um, Sterling, Colorado. I'm in the Northeastern Junior College. Uh, and I'm about to go into a wolf, state wolf reintroductory process, which is talking about from Proposition 114 that passed in Colorado doing wolf reintro into the state by 2023 not just talking or with different communities, but also reaching out to our indigenous communities. What do they think about this? Remember I showed you the map. <clears throat> we also have tribal jurisdiction issues. And so uh, what happens when, if, it, if a wolf is 
reintroduced on state land and comes to tribal land, what, what does that look like? So all these conversations are still ongoing. And so those are, those are two of the top ones, but I also think coming out of COVID, um, sustainable um, food sustainability uh, and access to food is so important. Building uh, a grocery store, which is conversations that are going on right now, building broadband infrastructure. And the third and the biggest thing I think I just now remembered, and I it's, can't believe I would even forget this, is to build the, first, the state's first uh, tribal uh, charter school on the, Ute, on the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in Toyot, Colorado. It's the state's first tribal uh, tribe's charter school. It's called Quayagat Community Academy. Quayagat means Ute and uh, bear in Ute. And check it out, KCA, um, and, and you'll find more information out there. Yeah, I was going to mention that one too uh, and ask you about it. And uh, I want to put in a plug. I really hope we can work with the Ute Nation, that Crow Canyon can work with the Ute Nation and do something with that new school. So let's, let's do it, Mark. And I, I would be happy. To, I'll make sure and forward that directly over to the school. And also for folks who are wondering, I mean, tribal schools, Montessori platform, charter platform, whatever it is, a lot of tribes have had success in this across the country. And this will be a school K through second grade to start that integrates youth history, youth culture, and youth language. Youth language is so important. I said 574 federally recognized tribes in the country, less than 200 speak their native language today. Unfortunately, I will be, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm the first out of five generations that cannot speak fluently. I can hear certain portions and I can recognize certain words and certain phrases, but it's not spoken with me on a daily basis. And I think programs like Fort Lewis College and other colleges and universities are starting to do revitalize that language. And I got to tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be re-entering that certificate program to, to do exactly that. That's great. So we're down to about uh, four minutes left. We're not going to get to all the questions, but I'll ask a few more. Maybe we can get some quick answers to them. Uh, here's one. Do you have an example of sacred Ute lands that currently aren't owned by the Utes that could be repatriated to tribal control? That's a great question. And in fact, if folks haven't seen the article that came out in the Atlantic <clears throat> by the individual who was saying that um, advocating that national parks be managed by tribes, go check that out. It's a fascinating article. I think this also opens up opportunity for Native Hawaiians. I think there are definitely portions. I think first and foremost, Bears Ears needs to be, I mean, the whole point of having a co-managed, that was gonna be the first one, the first in the country, a, co, a, a park that was gonna be co-managed by tribes. I think that needs to be one of the first options. I think every other national park or historic site that has an indigenous relationship and partnership needs to have a co-management portion. I'll just say that right now. Great answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Um, are there places or resources that tell the Ute story to tourists? Uh, because I know nothing about this history is what one person wrote in. Wow, well, thank you for tuning into this. And I think the Ute Museum in Montrose, Colorado is great. The director, CJ Bradford, has been, done a, an amazing job. We just did a new exhibit there. It's also online. If you go to History Colorado, um, they also have the same exhibit in Denver, but they do have an online portion of there. I would start there. They have great resources. Um, so I'm going to finish. Oh, this sorry, Mark. One more thing. The Southern Ute Cultural Center in Ignacio, Colorado is also. A yeah, no area. kidding. That's a great resource. Um, and I'm just going to finish by asking you to comment on the history of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Park to tell people what it is, because I think a lot of people don't know about it. And it's one of the most incredible places to visit anywhere in the world. Well, that's definitely, I think, one of the best kept secrets in Colorado. I think it's one of the best opportunities to go. Um, you can go on the website, Google Ute Mountain Tribal Park. It's only open for a certain amount of time during the summertime because we, we don't have the paved roads, it's all dirt, it's done. You can only get back there with a tribal guide. Um, and the Ute Mountain Tribal Park was really preserved by my great grandfather, Chief Jack House, really gave permission in the late seventies to open up to non-Ute members. So that's the only area on the Ute Mountain Reservation that we allow access 
for non-Ute members to go on. Um, Mesa Verde National Park was a part of the Ute Mountain Reservation until it was found in 1908 and then removed to be a national park. So everything around it, the Na Ute Mountain Tribal Park is twice the size of Mesa Verde National Park with even more cliff dwellings, even more surface sites, even more Ute history and pictographs and petroglyphs and everything there um, it will it will blow your mind what you see. I won't I won't spoil it for you. I'll just say that you you need to go. Yeah, I agree. It's my favorite place to go, and I feel very privileged to have done a number of tours there. Everybody, uh, there's still 150 people on the talk. I want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight, and I mostly want to take thank Ernest. You can tell by everything how busy a person he is, and. Uh, I just want to thank him for taking the time to make this presentation tonight. I learned a lot and um, really look forward to working with you in the future, Ernest. Thank you. Great to see you, Mark. Thank you again, everyone.